Thanks for clicking. We had an eventful week in China's real estate crisis this week as Evergrande has been unable to identify who or when they pledged the $2 billion that was seized by the banks last week. I don't know. We also received news of more auditor resignations and developers announcing they would be missing the March 31st deadline for China's real estate developers to complete on their debts. Finally, given the tumultuous economy and the continued uncertainty, we also received more reports about China's wealthy getting their money out of the country. Get me out of here! Given that, as we talked about last week, we're seeing more and more Chinese money pour into Canadian real estate, it's worth taking a look at where and how Chinese are moving their money elsewhere as it does have implications for our own market here in Canada. So today we'll check in with Evergrande, we'll take a look at that March 31st deadline, including which developers are going to be missing it and the consequences stemming therefrom. Then we'll take a look at the exodus of Chinese wealth leaving for Singapore amid the growing uncertainty in China. Next week should be a big week for our weekly China update, as we're expecting to get more data in on China's real estate market from the month of March. And more importantly, we're going to see which developers missed this big March 31st deadline, by how much did they miss it, and the consequences that have stemmed therefrom. Click like and subscribe if you want to get those updates, but for now, let's get into Evergrande. As mentioned last week, Evergrande had $2.1 billion in cash seized by the banks. Following this surprise cash seizure on the part of the banks, investors were obviously adamant trying to find out who and when was this $2 billion in cash pledged by Evergrande to these banks. How the was I supposed to know? It came out this week that Evergrande is still unsure who and why this $2 billion was pledged and has set up an internal probe, an internal committee, to try to find out the answer to those questions. I mean, it's one thing when a company is unable to pay its debts, it's a whole nother problem when they don't even know which debts they have. So this definitely isn't doing a whole lot to instill investor confidence in Evergrande. Not knowing where the money is, not knowing who pledged the money is definitely not going to help Evergrande's situation and it is for sure not going to help the situation of the rest of the real estate developers, which as we'll see are already having a massive transparency issue over the state of their debts. And I think we can see that this was on full display this week and Evergrande was forced to sell another development for $575 million as a means of shoring up liquidity. The $575 million project was sold to state-owned firms. Thank you. So while China had said it previously multiple times that they wouldn't be bailing out to any of these real estate developers, we can see yet again, and we've seen this before, but we can see yet again, when liquidity runs dry, the state buys these assets from these troubled real estate developers directly from Evergrande. So Evergrande is having its bank account seized, it doesn't know where the money was in the first place, it's turning to the state for help, for bailouts, and as we'll see, it's also missing its deadlines. Again, big surprise, but it's also missing its deadlines on the disclosure of the overall state of its debts. You can't do anything! Speaking of disclosing their debts, what we talked about in the past, that, that multiple real estate developers would not be making this much anticipated March 31st deadline for these developers to come clean on their debts, that total was released this week to be up to 10. So, up to 10 developers thus far have announced that they would not be making that March 31st deadline that investors are really looking to to find out how much debt these de developers are in, how much rot there is in the system, and 10 of these developers will not be doing it, at least not on time. As a result of this missed deadline, it was announced this week that six of these developers, six of the, of the developers that have had major debt issues that we've talked about in the past, will be suspended from trading. With investors having been looking forward to this March 31st deadline as a means of scaling, of gauging the scale of this debt, missing these deadlines is definitely not a great sign and injects a lot more worries, more worries than there already were, that there's a lot of hidden debt in China's real estate market, in China's overall economy, which is yet to be uncovered. Concerns rose even more this week, even more from missing the deadline, in that we had three more auditor resignations, three more resignations from the from these real estate developers, including those from Shimao, which was once considered strong. So Shimao was once, as we've talked about on this channel before, Shimao was once considered one of China's strongest real estate developers, and it looks at least there have been there must have been some accounting issues as these auditors are resigning en masse, not only from the rest of the developers, but also from this once considered strong developer as well. So, given that we've had all these resignations, these developers are missing the deadlines, we know how many defaults that there, that there has been. 
We don't know exactly because I think we've lost count, but we know how many defaults that there have been from these developers over the past six months or so. So as this March 31st deadline looms over the heads of these real estate developers and are definitely on the minds of these international investors looking to at least understand how much money they potentially have lost, how much money they think they might be able to get back. Um, this is definitely not a great sign for China's real estate market going forward. Nightmare. With so much uncertainty over the Russian crisis, over the economy, over real estate, over COVID, and definitely over the common prosperity agenda, there was a report that came out this week showing that the number of inquiries into Singapore into from wealthy individuals looking to move their money out of China and into Singapore into a perceived safe haven has doubled. Well, the report only offers anecdotal evidence, mainly that over $500 million has been moved into family offices into this one single company in Singapore, we kind of have to go off this anecdotal evidence as there is a real scarcity of data coming from China over, to, over their capital outflows. China obviously doesn't want to cause a stampede of, of, uh, of capital flowing out of the country if it becomes too apparent that the wealthy are leaving. So we do have to go over this anecdotal evidence. Now, last week we talked about $1 billion leaving for Canadian real estate. This week we talked about $500 million going to Singapore. And while this is only $1.5 million, it is still a drop in the bucket when it should be taken with a grain of salt. It nonetheless points to a growing trend of these wealthy individuals not thinking their money is safe and leaving China for safer havens. And this trend is definitely likely to continue as the economy continues to falter in China and we still don't even know the extent to which these developers are in massive amounts of debts. We've seen predictions before, but we, we don't know exactly the full extent and it doesn't look like we're going to get the full extent. So as China's economy continues to falter, this trend of the wealthy moving their money out of China is likely to continue and they're going to look for safe places to put it. So we talked last week again about that $1 billion leaving for Canada and it's likely that this is going to continue for the foreseeable future absent any major policy change on, um, on Canadian policymakers. We did receive news this week that Premier Ford in Ontario is increasing the foreign buyers tax to 20% and making it a province-wide foreign buyers tax. So you won't, you'll, if you're a foreign buyer buying in Canada, you'll be taxed at 20% no matter where you are in Ontario. We'll definitely have to wait and see if this foreign buyers tax will be effective in Ontario and obviously we'll have confounding variables as there are there are a number of other limiting factors on our real estate on our, on our real estate that is that are going on right now um, with a federal budget out next week and with interest rates rising clearly those are also going to limit our real estate market as well so it won't be clear initially the extent to which this foreign buyers tax was successful at limiting Chinese investment. But I think that but I think these reports that we saw today from Singapore and that we saw last week from Canada, from the, the, the Bank of China operating in Canada, I think we can see from these reports a growing trend. And if policymakers don't do something, don't do something to try to limit this inflow of money, this economic crisis, this real estate crisis in China is definitely coming to the West, 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 to the West's shores, to the US and in Canada's real estate market. We'll obviously have updates as they come out, as we get more and more anecdotal evidence, which I would I would assume would be coming down the pipe as this crisis continues. So as that evidence comes in, as we start to see the results of this foreign buyer's tax, we'll definitely have updates on this channel. Click like and subscribe if you want to get those updates, and thanks so much for watching.